Thank you for that kind introduction. I want to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this symposium for inviting me to share pediatric and adolescent gynecology, what you should know. Here is my obligatory disclosure slide declaring that I have nothing to disclose. Many of you are probably asking yourself, what exactly is pediatric gynecology and why is it important? You're not alone as many practicing physicians and advanced practice providers have never even heard of pediatric gynecology. Pediatric and adolescent gynecology or PEG is a rapidly growing, growing field. It was first established by Rudolf Peter in Prague in September, 1940. However, the first faculty positions were not established until 1962. The North American Society for Pediatric and Adolescent Gynecology or NASPEG was founded in 1986. More recently, the number of fellowship programs here in the US have continued to grow with 12 programs currently and a 13th about to be added. In 2018, ABOG, our uh, certifying organization, created a focused practice designation in pediatric and adolescent gynecology, further solidifying the unique care provided by PEG physicians the world over. We provide the full range of gynecologic care from birth until the 18th birthday. PEG practices, especially those situated completely within children's hospitals, do not routinely provide obstetrical care, although some PEG fellowships do include clinical exposure to teen OB clinics. Gynecology touches so many aspects of the lives of those assigned female at birth that we participate in a large number of multidisciplinary clinics to bring our expertise to the patients. Here at Primary Children's Hospital, I participate in the CHARM or colorectal, Hirschsprung, and anorectal malformation clinic, the DSD or disorders of sexual differentiation clinic, the joint hematology oncology clinic, as well as clinics with our oncologists, including cancer survivorship and hereditary cancer syndrome clinics. We also plan to join spina bifida clinic, IBD clinic, and Turner syndrome clinic as our program grows. Pediatric gynecologists perform a wide variety of surgeries. Procedures include reconstructive surgeries for malarian anomalies, laparoscopy for pelvic pain, ovarian masses and admexal masses, removal of vaginal foreign bodies, examinations under anesthesia for prepubertal complaints, and complex surgeries in multidisciplinary teams for anomalies such as cloacas and DSDs. Pediatric gynecologists also provide gender affirming care to our transgender and non-binary populations. Today, I'll briefly touch on a common complaint seen by PEG providers, as well as some topics that are more up and coming in the field. Throughout this talk, I will use the terms female, girls, and women for simplicity, but please know that the subjects I'm discussing also apply to non-binary and trans patients who are assigned to female at birth and have typically re female reproductive structures. Vulvar care has been in social media headlines quite frequently lately. In March, Vagisil launched their OMV line that you see here that is marketed towards teenagers. Several gynecologists on social media, including some pediatric gynecologists, went after the company for marketing an unnecessary product towards teen girls, an already vulnerable population. My most favorite line from all of this, quote, your vulva is not supposed to smell like a pina colada, end quote. Vaginal and vulvar complaints are a huge part of a pediatric gynecology practice, just as it is for my adult colleagues. In our younger kids, we see a lot of vulvar irritation due to the things that we see here, like bubble baths, bath bombs, leotards. The most frequent presenting complaints are redness, irritation, and discharge. These complaints are frequently misdiagnosed as yeast infections, and kids are treated with multiple rounds of oral and topical antifungals, like the fluconazole seen here, before presenting to gynecologic care. A good rule of thumb is that you're if you're out of diapers and haven't hit puberty yet, it's not yeast. The pH of the vagina is not favorable for yeast at that age. A patient with a culture proven yeast infection in this age range should prompt further evaluation for diabetes and or other immunocompromise. 
Teens also often present with complaints of vulvar irritation or vaginal discharge. Just like in younger kids, these complaints are often hygiene related. Society makes girls feel like vaginal discharge is not normal, despite it being very normal. And so teens are often trying to eliminate oral discharge. Commonly, teens will wear panty liners every single day to try to absorb all the vaginal discharge. Liners are so irritating though. And because of this irritation, the body often produces more discharge in what becomes quite the vicious cycle. We also discuss the important role the pubic hair plays in protecting the delicate vulvar skin. If I had a nickel for every time I told someone to use a bland topical emollient, think things like Vaseline and Aquaphor for their vulvar complaints, I think I would be a millionaire. My eight-year-old daughter actually asks me almost every day how many people I told to use Aquaphor during clinic on that day. Now we're gonna to shift to a new and exciting service that the team is excited to be able to provide soon within the Intermountain West. Each year, about 89,000 young people aged 15 to 39 are diagnosed with cancer. We refer to this group of patients as AYA or adolescents and young adults. In addition, about 10,500 children under age 15 will be diagnosed with cancer each year. As our therapies improve, many more of these patients are surviving past five years and becoming adults. As patients live longer, the early and late consequences of cancer management are beginning to assume greater importance for survivors, their families, and their providers. When considering the long-term sequelae of cancer therapy, infertility surfaces as a primary concern, particularly among female survivors. Additionally, fertility concerns are not limited only to cancer patients, but also patients with medical conditions, such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, as well as those patients with disorders of sexual differentiation and gender dysphoria. Traditionally, female cancer patients who wanted to have their own biologic children in the future had limited options, such as protecting the ovaries from radiation and emergency oocyte cryopreservation. While shielding is routine, not all patients may be eligible for oocyte cryopreservation. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation opens up another avenue for fertility preservation for these patients. Most importantly, it allows prepubertal patients undergoing gonadotoxic therapies to have an option for fertility preservation where none previously existed. It also allows for postpubertal patients who cannot delay their therapy starts by two to three weeks to have an option for fertility preservation. As of 2019, over 130 children have been born to patients who underwent orthotopic autotransplantation after previous ovarian tissue cryopreservation, including a patient who was prepubertal at the time of the initial tissue harvest. In patients with bloodborne cancers, it's possible to isolate immature oocytes from the cryopreserved tissue and mature them in vitro followed by in vitro fertilization and embryo transfer. In the adult population, ovarian tissue cryopreservation is no longer considered experimental, although it is still considered experimental in our pediatric population because of the limited number of patients. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation requires a laparoscopy that is often combined with another surgical procedure, such as a port placement to limit the patient's anesthesia exposure to harvest one ovary, like that seen in the upper left corner of this slide. The tissue is then prepared in the lab and cryopreserved. The tissue is processed by an embryo embryo embryologist with cortical strips prepared as seen in this slide. The tissue is then frozen. At a later date, it can be thawed and then auto-transplanted if there's no concerns for malignancy within the tissue, such as with bloodborne cancers. All right. Sticking with the theme of ovaries, but transitioning from cancer to torsion and the prevention of future torsion events. In the pediatric and adolescent population, torsion is a rare event that usually occurs in the presence of an adnexal mass. However, normal ovaries do torse and are more likely to experience recurrent torsion in the premenarchal patient. Although the data is inconsistent, Ufropexy has been proposed to decrease the risk of torsion of a normal ovary, although no consensus exists to describe appropriate candidates or the preferred surgical technique. 
we are currently conducting a large multi-center retrospective study to examine the rate of recurrent adnexal torsion with and without oophorpexy to help establish best practices for this procedure. In our pilot data, 141 unique patients had a total of 171 torsion events. A total of 44 of those patients had either at least two torsion events and or one oophorpexy, while 23 of those patients had a pexy completed after a single torsion with no future torsion events. We identified seven patients who had three or more torsion events. Five of these seven patients torsed both before and after a pexy. Our pilot data show an overall recurrent torsion rate of 15% and a rate of 17.6% after pexy. These rates are consistent with the small single site studies currently reported in, in the literature. It seems that some patients retain the risk of torsion even after pexy, and this may suggest that the patients were repeatedly torse uh, sorry, may suggest that the patients who repeatedly torse may benefit least from oophorpexy. There's a risk that in a patient who has previously had a pexy performed, that they will have an increased time to surgical care as ovarian torsion may be lower on the differential when presenting to the ER. It is important to maintain a high clinical suspicion for torsion, even in patients who have previously had a pexy completed, especially those are, who are pre-monarchal at the time of their presentation. Finally, we're gonna to transition to a group of complex pelvic anomalies that should be of interest to adult women's health providers. Anorectal malformations occur in about one in 4,000 live births, while cloacal anomalies occur in about one in 20,000 live births. Many patients born with these anomalies will have normal reproductive tract ana anatomy. However, they are at an increased risk of reproductive tract anomalies. In less complex, anal rectal malformations or ARMs, such as rectovestibular fistula and imperfect anus, a vaginal septum will be the most commonly seen gynecologic anomaly. In patients born with a cloaca, greater than 50% of them will have a malarian anomaly with uterine didelphus being the most common finding. Around 10% of patients with anal rectal malformations will have malarian agenesis, also known as meyer rokitansky kusterhauser or MRKH syndrome. These facts are significant for those providing adult gynecologic care as the surgeries that are completed throughout infancy and childhood will have impacts on the care provided to these patients as adults. Most importantly, many of these women may elect to attempt pregnancy. The data is very limited with only one paper published in 2019 really examining obstetrical outcomes. Currently, we counsel patients who have undergone a cloacal repair or a posterior sagittal anorectal plasty for imperfect anus to deliver via cesarean. Unfortunately, the counseling likely needs to be much more nuanced than this. If a patient is incontinent or only continent with a catheterizable stoma, a vaginal delivery may be a preferred route of delivery to protect the stoma that allows them to maintain social continence. Another important consideration in this population is the need for cervical cancer screening. Based on a survey we completed, adult gynecologists are less sure of the need for a PAP when a patient has a neovagina or non-native vaginal tissue. It is important to remember that all patients with a cervix require PAP screening within ASCCP guidelines, no matter what tissue their vagina is composed of. Patients without a cervix, but with a mucosal-based neovagina may have cervical cytology screening completed, although the guidance on this is much more limited. Finally, patients with colonic neovaginas require colonoscopy at the time of the tissue to screen for colon cancer. All of this is important because large numbers of these women are reproductive aged or are soon to become reproductive aged. Our survey showed that less than 15% of participants were familiar with the associated reproductive tract anomalies in patients with anal rectal malformations. Less than 10% were familiar with Mitrofenov and Malone catheterizable stomas, and the overall confidence of caring for women with ARMs was low. I want to thank you for listening to my presentation on pediatric gynecology. I'm excited to be here in Utah as a resource for all those caring for pediatric patients with gynecologic needs. Please feel free to reach out anytime to discuss or refer a patient. I'll now take any questions that you might have about my presentation 
or about pediatric and adolescent gynecology in general.